Hi everyone, this is Jeff Suda with the Steel Utility Poll Coalition. I'm gonna give everyone a little bit more time uh, to join, um, but in the meantime, uh, and working with this format, I'm trying to make this presentation as interactive as possible. Um, and with a lot of the attendees, I just wanted to get a little feedback of who's attending today, uh, what you're looking to get out of this presentation, just so I can really tailor this presentation and make it as beneficial as possible to you. So while we wait for everyone else to join, I've put up a survey on the screen. There are three questions on this survey, so you do have to scroll down. If you could please fill out the survey so I can get a better idea and really um, make this presentation as beneficial as possible. So we're gonna wait another uh, three to five minutes uh, to allow more people to join. All right, it looks like the majority of people have joined. So um, hello everyone, I'm Jeff Suda, um, and you are attending the Stay at Home series, a free six part uh, webinar series on how to build a better distribution and sub transmission system using steel utility poles. Today's presentation is a, a recap of steel pole case studies and what has worked for other users. Um, we'll get back to those survey questions in a little bit, um, but I just wanted to go over a few housekeeping items first. Um, if you can't hear me right now, um, you know, there is a dial-in number if your audio is not clear that was posted in the chat feature or is on this screen. Later today or tomorrow at the latest, you will receive an email uh, with a link to um, a copy of all these slides. I've been getting a lot of feedback that the recordings of these presentations have been very helpful for people. So I've been posting them to YouTube. A link to the um, YouTube uh, of this recording will be on the first page of the slide, just like it's been on all the other ones. But if for any reason you can't find it, feel free to just search the title of this presentation in YouTube and it should come up. Um, if you're having any technical difficulties, please feel free to use the chat feature on the bottom right hand uh, corner of the screen. And then really with this presentation, I'm, I'm trying something a little bit different with trying to put out uh, additional resources in that chat function. So I'll, I'll post copies of the case studies and some other interesting facts. Um, so really let me know what you think of this different format and if it's something that's adding to it or distracting. So as I mentioned, this is part of the Stay at Home webinar series. Um, this webinar series is held every Thursday from 11 a.m. to 12 east, uh, Eastern time. And we still have one additional presentation after this next week on May 28th. This will be a steel pull Q&A session with a panel of experts where we will recap many of the questions asked during this entire webinar series, as well as open it up for questions. So if you have any information that you didn't get that you were looking for during this presentation, um, or there was something that wasn't clear, this will be your time to really ask those. So now let's look at the survey that you all filled out and I wanna thank you for participating. So looking at you know who we have in the audience today, it looks like we have a, a large um, number of people in consulting, working for utilities, some galvanizers, sales and others. So in this presentation, knowing that we have um, a little bit more technical, I'll try and focus a little bit more on the technical side with that. Uh, looking at the level of uh, experience, um, you know, we have a good mix, but with having some of the minimal level, I'll try and make sure to really go into some concepts that might be specific to steel poles and, and really try to stop myself when I use terminology that might not be specific to you. So looking at what you're looking for uh, in the case studies, what value propositions you'd like to be discussed. Uh, it looks like solving unique solutions is the number one. Um, so we have uh, a case study by Blue Bonnet that really goes into detail on that. Then we have uh, lower life cycle cost. Uh, Tucson Electric, we have a case study on that. Really, that's what drove them to switch to steel. And then longer service life, um, all three of them really, that was the focus. Um, but the case study for carbon light and power uh, will go into detail on that. So thank you for this survey. 
Um, hopefully, you know, with this information, I'll be able to really tailor this presentation more to who's in the audience. So for today's agenda, um, there's a lot of people who didn't attend the first uh, webinar where I went into a little bit more detail on introducing the coalition. So I thought it would be good to give everybody a more in-depth uh, overview of the coalition, giving you an idea of who we are, you know, what resources we offer, and how we can be of service to you. Before we get into the case studies, I really want to make sure that the benefits or value proposition for steel utility poles are, are understood. With any case study presentation, really that's what you're going over is you know, what utilities implement it, what values of that product they want. So I want to make sure that that's clear, and then we'll get into the case studies. So introducing the Steel Utility Pole Coalition. The Steel Utility Pole Coalition is a coalition of industry groups manufacturers and end users whose goal is to promote steel poles for use in sub-transmission and distribution through education, research, and marketing. To give you a little history of the Steel Utility Pole Coalition, we started out as a Steel Utility Pole Task Group uh, led by AISA, which was established back in 1998 to grow the market for distribution and sub-transmission steel poles. In 2019, the Steel Utility Pole Task Group transformed into the Steel Utility Pole Coalition to revive the group as well as to add additional members. The SUPC is made up of steel producers, manufacturers, coders, and industry organizations. Today, over 600 utilities are now using steel distribution poles and over 1 million have been installed to date. So one of the biggest areas that we focus on is our lineman training program. Really, a large reason the Steel Utility Pool Coalition was formed was realizing in the industry there wasn't the educational resources to have linemen comfortable with using steel as well as the informational resources needed. The objective is to provide the electric utility with educational information on the installation and maintenance of steel distribution and sub-transmission poles. Uh, this program was started in 2005 and since then we have now educated over 2,000 students, 141 instructors, 62 apprentices, 481 utility linemen, in over four are in over 25 states. In our training program, we have two main training tracks. <clears throat> two main training tracks. The first one is our de-energized program, which is geared more towards students or other non-linemen um, people in the utility industry. Topics that we cover in this tract are a steel utility pole overview, general safety guidelines, drilling and framing, climbing, assembly and erection, foundations, and then removal of poles. We have three formats that we offer with this education program. First is our online training program. So with that, we have a um, web-based client that goes through a presentation, a video, and a quiz. Now, if you're an instructor or maybe um, you manage the training for your utility and you're interested in having and seeing, you know, how your students are progressing or what scores are getting on the quizzes, we can set up a specific modular for your students specifically or employees. If not, everyone does get a certificate of completion. Um, so if you're just looking to make sure someone does that, you can check that as well. We offer instructor training and field training. I'm gonna go ahead and post the link to our training in the um, side chat, just so everyone can have that. All right, our second tract for our educational program is our energized uh, curriculum. With that, we cover a lot of the same topics as are de-energized, but we go more in depth on assembly and erection and include uh, instructions for in two-piece poles, live line installation, and sub-transmission. With our energized, we partnered with TND Power Skills and ISPC, the Institute for Safety and Power Line Construction, to offer these trainings. Additional training material we offer are training demo videos, training manuals. So if you're an instructor or uh, someone who's in charge with safety or training at your utility and you're interested, we have full 
uh, our full teaching implement. So we have PowerPoint presentations we can provide for you to either use or edit, uh, binders and material for your students, quizzes to hand out, as well as a copy of a DVD with the videos. So if you're interested in that, please let me know and we can get you a copy. Additional training information on top of our educational programs are our Get Current with Steel Utility, our with Steel Utility Polls uh, pamphlet, a 10-step guide into building a better distribution and subtransmission system with Steel Utility Polls, case studies, which the three we listed we're going to talk today, but we have over 10 case studies, a life cycle analysis study, and then a total cost of ownership spreadsheet, which we are having, an, we're actually updating and should have a newer, more user-friendly version out later this year. So going more into detail on the life cycle analysis study, the goal of this study was to use life cycle analysis to compare the environmental performance of utility pools made from wood and galvanized steel. In this study, 45 categories were looked at, and of those, 35 showed a clear benefit for galvanized steel, four didn't show a benefit towards either, and six showed clear benefits toward woods pools. Some of the bigger things that came up in that were uh, it, it actually takes less greenhouse emissions to produce a steel utility pool and throughout the life and disposal um, or recyclability in steel's case for that. Lower terrestrial biome disturbance when uh, with steel pools, as well as um, less demand on energy for producing and again, end of life of steel poles. So with COVID-19 and social distancing happening, we are really focusing a lot more on social media. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and put links to all of our social media in the chat. Um, you know, if you like this content, this webinar, please follow us. Uh, we'll be posting more content regularly. Um, some of the upcoming content that we're producing is after this webinar series, um, I'm putting together a weekly video series uh, that will go into topics related to steel utility poles, distribution systems, and pretty much anything interesting. These videos will be pretty informal and pretty short, generally a couple minutes long, um, but they will be posted weekly. Uh, additionally, I'm committing to posting, uh, you know, consistently posting resources and information on steel utility poles or distribution. Um, so if you have any interest, feel free to follow our social media. Also at the top of our page, um, I've added a banner where you can click here to follow us on LinkedIn. So that's really the introduction of the Steel Utility Poll Coalition. So if you have any information or, or if you have any more questions or want more information, Feel free to visit our website at steelpowerpools.com. Uh, you can find training videos, case studies, and research. Um, just so you know, uh, the website does currently forward to the old task group, uh, and we will have a new website up shortly. But just to keep the link the same, to not confuse you, steelpowerpools.com will stay the same. So now that I've introduced the coalition, I really wanted to go, what are the value propositions of steel utility pools, or, or really what are the benefits um, before we get into the case studies? <clears throat> so for steel utility pools, a big one that you see uh, steel utility pools used for are system hardening. Um, what that is, is you might have a, a storm event that a traditional pole um, might not be able to handle. So with Steel, it's really good at handling these extreme loading events, uh, really for a few reasons, mainly due to how steel poles fail, uh, which I'll go more in depth on the case studies, um, <clears throat> being a consistent and manufactured product, our engineered and manufactured product, you have a consistent uh, loading, or a consistent pole that can handle a loading over every single pole in that design. Um, as well as uh, with the hardening, some of its deterioration methods are a lot um, more predictable than wood as far as its loading capacities. The second proposition is durability, which is a lot of the reasons of why steel utility poles do so well in system hardening, but that also has to do with its, um, you know, coating and ability to really just last a long time 
which brings us into service life. So steel utility poles generally last about twice as long as a wood equivalent. And now that's not gonna be true for every environment, but for the majority of environments, um, that's pretty true. Environmental benefits. So I went into a little bit of that in the LCA uh, life cycle analysis um, slide, but I'll go more in detail in the case studies. And then steel utility pools are great at solving special use cases that wood or other options just really don't do a good job at. Uh, one of the bigger ones we see are uh, woodpeckers, lightning, fire, uh, system hardening, if you want to consider it that, or uh, for hard to reach places with steel poles, they're much lighter and they last a lot longer. And then finally, bringing everything together of those benefits, looking at the full life cycle cost of the pole. So a steel utility pole generally costs two to three times a wood pole. But once you look at the benefit, as well as the reduced cost with the extended service life and reduced maintenance, a lot of the times the life cycle cost is the same or a lot less than wood, but you get the added benefits of steel utility poles. So going into our first case study, um, I'm going to talk about carbon power and lights. So carbon power and lights is a uh, electric cooperative in Wyoming and Colorado with 6,100 customers. They manage a 4,500 square mile territory, um, which is, I mean, that's huge. And it really spans a lot of different um, territory. So it goes from plains to high altitude mountains. They have 130 miles of transmission line and 1,730 miles of distribution line. And really to drive home the point of, you know, or give you a better picture of what their uh, operating system is like, on average, they have three customers per line mile. So they're very spread out and very rural. You know, what about their, or I'll give you some details about their system details right now. Um, they install on average 300 to 400 steel utility poles annually typically using class three or class four, four poles ranging in height from 30 to 70 feet. In the 1990s, they switched to using almost 100% steel poles in new construction. And as of right now, they install less than 10 poles annually and have over 4,600 steel distribution poles, which this number is when we did this case study back in 2012. Um, for this case study, I, I do have a link which has more details on it. So I'm gonna put that in the chat feature. Uh, it's a great write-up done by uh, Dan Snyder of AISI. So if you're interested, uh, feel free to go in there. But why did they choose steel? At the time when they're evaluating it, there was a spike in uh, wood pole prices. So when they're looking at different options, they saw steel utility poles had a much greater life and in CP and L's environment, uh, up to 80 years, which was double that of wood. Uh, also, with that increased life, it really reduced the amount of time they had spent or they have to spend on replacing poles. Uh, CP and L is it's pretty small utility. Uh, I believe they have 12 to 15 linemen uh, full time on staff. So they really don't have the manpowers to be re replacing a lot of poles. But that's really what initially drew them to that. <clears throat> After using it for a while, uh, the price of wood eventually did come back down. So these Additional benefits are what still allows them to use steel and makes them, you know, really go for that decision, even though now steel is a little bit pricier than when they first looked at it in the 90s. So the second reason would be durability and reliability. So storm hardening. Every year, uh, they lose some of the remaining wood poles to ice. To date, they have yet to replace a steel pole due to an ice storm event. Now, they do have lines come down, but the poles are not damaged, which makes bring, getting power back online much qu uh, quicker. In addition, since they have a lot of planes in their area, uh, they have a lot of high winds, and they've had issues in the past with some of their wood poles not being able to handle those additional forces. Uh, what can be a little counterintuitive thinking of a, a large metal pole, they actually protect against lightning strikes. So in some cases, lightning strikes can actually damage the top of a wood pole uh, and it'll have to be cut off and um, you know, uh, trimmed until they can replace it. 
but with a wood pole, it can handle that damage a lot better. It eliminates damage for woodpeckers in some other areas, and then it reduces the risk of fire from both lightning and broken down insulators as steel is a non-combustible material. Steel offers an environmentally responsible alternative to wood. So as I had mentioned in the LCA, uh, there's a lot of benefits on the environmental side, but some of those are uh, steel utility pools are composed of 100% non-hazardous materials. They contain at least 75% recycled content when manufactured and are 100% recyclable after their service life. So to compare that to a wood pole, um, because of the preservatives used in them, a lot of them are considered hazardous materials, so special precautions need to be taken, taken at the disposal of the end of their service life, which ends up costing the utilities money. There's less maintenance when they switch to steel utility poles. So a wood pole over time will shrink as it dries out from that pressure treating process to get the preservatives um, that make them last their service life. With wood poles, you don't have that shrinkage, so you don't need to go back periodically and re-tighten hardware. Um, and then with that longer service life, uh, it really makes it to where there's less time to replacing it, less maintenance, uh, less really dealing with the pull itself. An additional benefit, um, not really to steel utility pulls specifically, is when they switched to pulls, they redesigned their system and went with best, best practices according to the Avian Powerline Interactive Committee or APLIC uh, to really be in line with that. And um, with that redesign, they went to fiberglass cross arms. They suspended the conductors below the cross arm, giving birds less of an opportunity of somewhere to perch to where they can go from the cross arm to uh, the conductor. And they really paid a lot more attention to their circuit to phase or phase to ground separation. So we're gonna get into the second case study, which is Tucson Electric Power. So Tucson Electric Power is a municipal, or is a uh, cooperative utility in Southern Arizona. They have 2,200 megawatts of generating capacity, 20,000 plus miles of power lines, 400,000 customers, and they manage 1,155 square, foot, uh, square miles of territory. Now, comparing this to uh, carbon power and light, you can see that this is a much more urban environment. So their needs are going to be a little bit different uh, where they, they have, you know, a way more customers and in an area that's about the third the size. So some details on their system, they replace 700 to 900 pools annually out of 125,000 in their system. 90% of their system was wood before 2000. And at the time of this case study, 95% uh, of all new distribution pools were steel. So why did they make the choice to switch to steel? For um, Tucson Electric, really the main reason that drove them was life cycle cost. So this is a, a screenshot from our life cycle of cost analysis. And it takes into account additional maintenance cost uh, considered with wood and are reduced with steel. Uh, extended service life, and then if you have a lot of special use cases, you can also put that into it. Uh, the calculator is it's pretty good as you can get it to really work with your utilities. It, it's not super user friendly right now, but it does have many fields to where you can really dial it in for your specific situation. But looking at this chart, these are the three main sizes they use on distribution pools. And you'll see it looking at the full life cycle costs even though the initial cost is much greater of a steel utility pole, it's actually less or equal to a wood pole, but you also get the additional benefits of a steel utility pole. So the second reason was durability and reliability. So for them with storm hard, uh, hardening, it's very common to see microburst wind events in TEP service area. They used to have a huge problem with uh, cascading effect to where when a microburst wind event came, it would bring down one power line, which would transfer the force to the next, and then the next, and the next, bring down multiple power lines, making it very costly and time consuming to get that line back up. Um, really, how they were introduced 
to Steele initially was looking of how to mitigate that issue. And, and they looked at putting what they called a, a stopper pull or a steel pull once every five pulls to reduce that. But after looking at the life cycle analysis, they just decided that why do just every five if it's actually going to be cheaper or the same to get all these benefits? So I talked about in the value proposition that steel has consistency and strength rating because it's a manufactured and engineered product. So like I mentioned, with a specific steel utility pole, you know when you buy 500 of them, every single one of those is going to have the design criteria that you purchase. There isn't going to be any ambiguity, any differences like you might see in wood. Wood being a harvested product, there are variabilities in strength. Uh, you have different grain structures, knots, curves, bows, and in general, you'll get the loading you think you want, but in these microburst events where one pull is creating another one to come down, having one weak link can put a lot of force into the next pull, bringing it down. So having that inconsistency was a big problem for their system. So there's no loss of strength for a steel utility pole due to aging. Um, and as I'd mentioned, wood poles generally age uh, through either rotting or fungus. And now this process is very slow, but it usually either starts at the top of the pole or in the center of the pole where there's the least amount of preservative, which is called heart rot. As this progresses through the life of the pole, the you know, rating of that pole or the ability for it to carry load really depreciates as it goes. That can be a huge issue if you have an area where you think you put this in and you go, okay, well, we have a 40-year lifespan in this area, but the deterioration or corrosion is, is way higher than you think it is. So you come back in for your inspection um, and you know it's way further along and the strength rating is just not there. With steel utility poles, the deterioration or aging method that is used is for a galvanized pool, uh, you have a zinc coating, which is a sacrificial protective barrier. So as it ages, the zinc is consumed, not affecting the strength of the steel, underlying steel at all. So in that same scenario where you have a pole that you put in and the corrosion rate or the deterioration rate is just way higher than you expect it, when you come back, the zinc will be a little bit thinner than you expected, but the strength rating is still there, so you can do some mitigation efforts before you have a big issue. And then for um, TEP specifically, they cited a better failure method in urban environments. So for them, the specific example was car crashes. So when a car crashes into a wood pole, a lot of the times it'll break, bringing down the line, creating a very dangerous uh, event for the driver of the vehicle in the crash, as well as knocking out power um, in their system. With steel poles, because metal goes from, uh, once you're above its loading criteria, it gets into what's called the plastic deformation zone. So once it's bent, or it won't bounce back and you will need to replace the pole, but it will be able to absorb a much higher amount of energy where it will just bend, keeping the line up and really not bringing the line down, creating that hazardous situation for um, the driver in this, or in this scenario. So now we're gonna get into the third case study. So this is of Blue Bonnet Electric Cooperative in Southeastern Texas. They have 103,000 plus customers, 3,800 3, square miles of territory, 11,800 miles of line, and 200,000 plus poles. So with their um, size, they're a happy medium between the first and second case studies where they have a little bit of rural territory as well as some more urban environments. Uh, their system has large portions of heavily wooded areas that are hard to access and they have frequent thund thunderstorms and occasional hurricane force winds being in Texas. So why do they choose steel? Um, so, you know, in the survey, I mentioned that special use cases was their biggest use of steel. So for them, they were having a huge issue with woodpeckers. They would put in a pole and it would only last five years. So with that, the, the cost of uh, steel being much more, it became way more beneficial to where you have a five-year product 
versus depending on their environment, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80 year product uh, put in that doesn't have that issue. They have a lot of issues with lightning strikes. So as I had mentioned in the carbon light and power, you know, the damage done by lightning strikes to poles is much less on wood or on steel than wood. And you really don't have to worry as much about uh, the fires that can happen from lightning strikes. And then with their heavily wooded areas, they have a lot of difficult to access areas and terrain. Steel utility poles were really, um, you know, interesting to them because of these areas, they saw that the additional cost to install a pole in the area made it way more beneficial to install a steel utility pole that has a twice the average life of a wood pole and not have to deal with that as often, as well as getting the additional benefits on these poles, which are harder to maintain and access. So like all the other utilities, they also use them for stored storm hardening. Uh, so they occasionally see hurricane forced winds and steel utility poles are just better at dealing with high loading events that you can see with these storms. And then life cycle cost, which for all these case studies, uh, really those benefits that they look into life cycle cost is pretty much, you know, the justification show, yeah, this is true. We get all these benefits, but it also is financially benefiting us. Uh, with that, it was the reduced maintenance cost, especially in those hard to reach areas, and then the reduced cost of replacement because it was lasting so much longer. So that's what I have today. We have plenty of time for any questions. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask them in the chat function on the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. I know Melissa's on. I didn't do the best job of seeing your questions while presenting. So if I missed anything, Melissa, let me know, uh, and then we'll address them right now. You hear me? So additionally, uh, if you want um, full write-ups of the other case studies, I'm gonna go ahead and post those in the chat function. So a question is asked of, do we happen to have a similar life cycle cost analysis for reinforced, reinforced concrete poles? Uh, currently we do not. The life cycle analysis we did was between wood poles and um, galvanized steel. And I, I think it was Southern Pine specifically. Uh, I know there are additional life cycle analysis done by other uh, organizations. Um, so I can look and see if I can find something, but as of right now, I don't know of one that goes into reinforced concrete. So Emmanuel asked, do we find it easy to convince people uh, who use wood poles uh, to go with steel? Is there any considerable increase in the use of steel poles in the last year? So really, it depends a lot on the utility. There can be a lot of hurdles to uh, go with. A lot of it is just familiarity with wood poles, which is why we really focus on education. Uh, and then that initial cost can be a, a big hurdle for some utilities. Um, so really showing, you know, yes, you are paying more upfront, 
but it's actually going to be cheaper um, is, is one of the best methods to really convince people to, to look at it. And then showing all the additional benefits on top of just the cost uh, really helps. So we, we do have um, some issues convincing people, um, but we are seeing a trend to where steel is not just a material used on special cases and bec is becoming more and more common. So for everyone who's having the audio issues, uh, we do have a recording of this, as I mentioned. Um, there will be, the, or this will be posted on YouTube later today. So if you are not able to listen, I, I wanna apologize for that first, but um, you know, if you missed any part of it, feel free to look that up on YouTube. And when we send out the copy of these slides, the first slide will have a link to that recording. So Brad, to answer your question, I really don't know as far as the pricing goes between uh, ductile iron. Um, let me see. I believe I can pull your email address. I'll look into it and get you an answer. Um, so I'll, I'll get you an answer later today on that. So Dennis asks, can the coating galvanize be damaged by mishandling collisions or other events uh, to compromise the integrity? Uh, yes, it can, but the galvanized coating is actually metallurgically bonded to the steel. So it, it's much more difficult to uh, damage it compared to uh, a, or a, a painted coating or something like that. Um, so you can damage it in handling it you can field repair that if you have issues. Um, actually, the, the repair guide in the field, there is no maximum size that you can repair. Um, so if you do have that, um, you know, you can really fix minor blemishes. Uh, for galvanizing, since it is a cathodic protection mode um, or a sacrificial element, if you do have a small nick that I believe is less than a quarter of an inch, and, and Melissa chime in in either audio or chat if that's a little incorrect being that you're more of an expert on galvanizing, uh, it can protect the area around it and not really be an issue. Uh, Dennis asked, how often do you have uh, these issues? And really, it, it's not a, a huge issue that comes up. You know, if, if you have um, mishandling uh, in transportation or something like that, you can have issues, but being that it is this stronger bond than you would get with a paint system, um, it's it's not you know something you see every day, but it is something that you know you might see regularly and can repair. So Hernando asked for a presentation on manufacturing of steel poles. Um, thank you for the feedback. We'll definitely look into that for future presentations. I know earlier we had a presentation on the engineering of steel utility poles, so that is some of the topics, but uh, I, I do agree going into how steel poles are made, maybe having a video in a factory could be beneficial. Uh, so thank you for that feedback. That really helps us create better content in the future.
All right, well, it looks like the questions are dying down. Uh, again, I want to invite everyone for next week's presentation on May 28th, uh, where we will have a steel pool question and answer with a panel of experts. Uh, and if there are any questions that you had unanswered, anything wasn't clear, or there's just a topic you want covered, uh, feel free to join and let us know. And on, in addition to the uh, audience participation, I'll come up with a lot of frequently asked questions as well as go through all the questions that were asked in this webinar series and compile them and go more into detail with that. So I wanna thank everybody for attending today um, and I hope to see you next week. So thanks a lot.